name is Susan Sterrett, and I'm the new director for the School of Public Policy here at UMBC. I'm delighted to have joined this group and delighted to be getting to know people. Um, speaking as someone who has uh, taught a long time, um, including at church, I want to say, come on in. You can move up, and, and, uh, and we're going to see you wherever you are, and, and I think it's easier to see the speaker if you move in a little bit. I'm delighted to welcome you here to our annual event honoring Judy Shinovel. I'm sorry I never had a chance to get to know her. I've, I've uh, heard such good things. She was a senior research scientist with UMBC's MIPAR, the Maryland Institute for Policy Analysis and Research, and she was an adjunct associate professor of public policy. Uh, she completed her BSc with distinction in pharmacy from Kansas University in 1988 and turned to policy and health policy after that. Uh, she received a master's degree in health policy from Harvard in 93 and a doctorate in public health economics from Johns Hopkins in 2001. She came to Washington in 1988 as an executive resident at the American Pharmaceutical Association and then she was a health policy and budget analyst with CBO. After she completed her, her PhD at Johns Hopkins with a uh, fellowship from the National Institute for Mental Health, she held faculty positions at University of South Carolina and University of Maryland College Park. We're, we're delighted she was able to join us. She conducted research as an academic health policy fellow at the National Center for Health Statistics. And she had been at UMBC since 2008, where her work for my part included studies on gambling, childhood obesity, and wellness initiatives. Her published work included articles on the effects of mental health insurance coverage on employees' disabilities, mental health parity and in insurance, economic costs of obesity, and pharmaceutical use among, among persons with disabilities. So we can see the ongoing importance of her work. Uh, the, um, she loved sports and competed in canine agility and uh, with two German short-haired pointers. Um, and, uh, Again, sadly, we lost her to a car accident several years ago. And as a result, um, her family established the Chernobyl Award in her memory to support, uh, to provide support for doctoral students committed to health policy research. She had a distinguished and productive career, and at the time of her death, as a, a senior research scientist um, with my part, and an adjunct faculty, we know that she would have been delighted to see her work continue among our graduate students sponsored by our wonderful faculty in health policy. Tonight's award recipient, Jennifer Smith, is the fifth student in the School of Public Policy to receive the Health Policy Research Award. Past recipients include Stephen Johnston, Michael Abrams, who's joined us this evening, Allison Mitchell, and Cheryl Camillo. I will now turn it over to Nancy Miller, who is Jennifer Smith's advisor and an expert in health policy research, to tell us a little bit more and introduce this year's recipient, Jennifer Smith. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Susan. So I'd like to uh, welcome everyone um, as well um, um, to recognize um, the, this award for Judith Chernobyl. Um, I will say I um, had the um, a chance to be a colleague with um, Judith, but um, in the um, spring of 2012, we had actually worked on a grant proposal, I think I've, I've said this um, before, that was um, to look at the um, effectiveness of um, interventions for children and youth with autism spectrum disorder. Um, and that was um, work that was to be collaborative with colleagues at the um, Towson University. Um, and that was actually funded later that year, and I um, would have appreciated the opportunity to have been able to work with um, and Judy on that um, research. So um, I'd like to, uh, it's my great um, pleasure to be able to introduce um, Jennifer Smith, who is the 2017 Chernobyl uh, Research Award um, recipient. Um, Jennifer Smith is a senior programmer at the Hilltop Institute. As such, she performs SAS programming in order to analyze large healthcare data sets for quality of care, outcome measurement studies, and program assessment. Ms. Smith's current projects require using Medicare, Medicaid, Maryland hospital data, and Maryland all-payer database to assess quality, cost, and utilization patterns for the Medicaid exchange churn population, mental health, substance abuse, and dual eligible populations of people eligible for both the Medicare and Medicaid programs. 
Um, she also has developed algorithms to report on the quality of care for newly enrolled Medicaid participants requiring continuous care, such as pregnant women and people with chronic conditions. Ms. Smith joined the Hilltop Institute as a research assistant and SAS programmer, and prior to that, she was a biostatistical programmer at Pacific Health Research Institute in Honolulu, Hawaii, where she focused primarily on data analysis, writing for publication, and scientific presentation. As director of quality assurance and training at Discovery Alliance, Inc., Ms. Smith administered internal audits, developed new procedures um, for documentation, and policies and operating procedures. And prior to that, Ms. Smith gathered experience as a clinical data manager at Paxil International Corporation, and she was a research administrator at the University of Illinois Chicago Health Policy and Administration in Cook County Hospital. It turns out that Jennifer and I have a Cook County Hospital connection separated only by about uh, 10 years, and we both <laughs> recall fondly uh, the, uh, the underground uh, pathways to get through uh, the hospital. Um, it's since been upgraded. There's a brand new facility, and maybe we'll make a field trip to visit <laughs> later. So um, Ms. Smith has an MPH in epidemiology from the University of Illinois Chicago, a certificate of advanced study in bioethics, and Health Policy from New Swanger Institute for Bioethics and Health Policy at Loyola University um, Chicago Graduate School, and a BS in Mathematics from Wheaton College. Um, she, um, as Susan said, she's currently pursuing a PhD in Health Policy um, <coughs> here in our School of Public Policy. Um, um, Ms. Smith now is a doctoral candidate, and as Susan said, I have the great privilege of chairing um, Jennifer's dissertation committee. And Jennifer, as you can see, is going to be talking about um, her dissertation research, which is focused on the um, comparative effectiveness of two different asthma treatments in the Medicaid population um, here in the state of Maryland. So please join me in welcoming this year's recipient, um, Ms. Jennifer Smith. If you'll excuse me, I'm just going to grab my notes. I forgot to bring them up to the podium. Okay, for the record, I hate public speaking. I'm gonna say that right at the beginning. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for coming and to thank the Schnuggle family for this award. I am greatly honored to receive it. I'd also like to thank Nancy, without whom I would not be standing here. She has encouraged me throughout the years and provided great mentorship and um, insight into public health in the healthcare field, as well as how to be a decent researcher. I'm only decent, Nancy's brilliant. <laughs> um, so as she mentioned, my research is in uh, comparative effect of examination of two asthma treatments. And whenever I start with this, people always say, oh great, you're researching asthma, you must really have a passion in asthma. And actually my passion is not in asthma, it's more in the comparative effectiveness research and how I think that really will help us move forward in our healthcare system to try to get out of, to try to get rid of some of the inefficiencies in our system and move us towards a better system in the long run. So then the question becomes, well, how did you pick asthma? And as I did research on where to, uh, what disease to look at, what I, realized was asthma kept coming up. We all know of cancer and AIDS and heart disease as being a big problem in the United States. And we tend to forget about asthma. And asthma is always ranked within the top 10 diseases as far as a top burden, whether or just on the population or in terms of healthcare costs. And it's also a rise, or yeah. So, um, sorry was a slide ahead. Um, so how do we evaluate the burden of asthma in our healthcare system in our nation? And currently, we estimate it as 2 million emergency department visits a year, 14 million doctor visits a year, nearly half a million hospitalizations for asthma, 3,600 3, deaths a year, and a price tag estimated at $56 billion just in healthcare costs alone. That does not include 
missed work or missed school days, and it also does not include work loss due to premature deaths. So that's just what we're spending in, in our health care costs. Uh, this is a low estimate. This estimate is from 2009. There really hasn't been a good estimate since then. Um, I think we're all waiting for it to come out. There are other um, suggested numbers out there, but it all depends on how you want to calculate it. This is what the CDC is reporting, so I figure we'll just go with that for the moment. But uh, as you can see, asthma has been rising since 1980. So if this was the price tag in 2009, I'm assuming that price tag has gone up. If for no other reason, then healthcare costs have gone up across the board. We're now at about 8.4%, and that has seems to be holding steady since about 2011. Um, however, again, we're still waiting for the CDC to come out with their new period prevalence. They tend to do asthma in a period prevalence rather than a year snapshot. So they tend to look at a decade at a time. But as you can see, it's been rising. This is due to a couple of effects. First of all, we're learning more about asthma and we're better able to diagnose it. So we're able to identify it better than we used to be in 1980. Uh, second of all, the irritants for asthma, such as air pollution and different climate issues, have changed since 1980. So we're also probably seeing an effect there. If we turn from prevalence to incidence, what we find out when we look at uh, subpopulations is that children have a higher rate of asthma than adults, females are more likely to have asthma than males, and um, when we look at by racial category, what we see is African Americans have a, definitely a higher rate than everybody else. The lowest rate in the uh, racial category is Hispanic. And actually, if people have started to tease out that category and found that Puerto Ricans have a rate, an incident rate of asthma actually higher than African Americans. They now rank about 16.6% uh, of all Puerto Ricans uh, have asthma. So it's a, it's a big concern within that population. If we look at it nationwide, it pretty much covers the entire nation as to who has asthma. The lighter color states are below the national average. The darker color states, the darkest color states, are above the national average. And as you can see, Maryland happens to have a higher rate than 8.4%. We're, we're above 9% right about now as far as how many people in Maryland have asthma. So I'm taking a look at inhaled corticosteroids and leukotriene, leukotriene receptor antagonists. Um, inhaler or ICS for one and LTRA or leukotriene for the other one. So you know my acronyms there. And the children are both using an inhaler. One's using it without a spacer, the other one uh, with a spacer. The spacer was developed uh, as, we go, as we go forward, I'll explain why the spacer was developed and how it's used now. The leukotrienes is just a pill that you take once a day. So the inhaler you may take a couple times a day, the leukotriene you take once. There's a lot of different inhalers out there. Typically when people think of an inhaler for asthma, what they're thinking about is when they went to the doctor with some sort of lung irritation and they were given a, uh, an inhaler to help them through that sickness. That could have been acute asthma, which typically resolves itself within a couple weeks. And that inhaler you were given is a rescue inhaler, typically albuterol. It's a short-acting drug and only meant to be used for a short period of time. The inhaled corticosteroids, on the other hand, are actually a drug that you will use for the rest of your life if you have chronic asthma, and you will use it at least once a day, if not multiple times a day. So the, the question is, is how do we know which is the better drug to use? And, um, or 
not only better drug, what's a better treatment? What's the best way to manage asthma? It's a growing problem, so how do we help out with reducing healthcare costs by treating it better, managing it better? What do we do? And the answer is we go to the evidence. And from the evidence, we have developed best practice guidelines so that we can direct people on the best way to treat it, direct doctors on the best way to treat it. Policymakers can develop a good program to help their communities so that they can try to control asthma. And what we can look to today are two different types of best practice guidelines. The first is a Global Initiative for Asthma, otherwise known as GINA. This is a worldwide coalition uh, people, experts from all over the world come together to pour over the evidence and come to decisions on what the evidence says the best route for treating asthma is. The National Institutes of Health does participate in GINA and uh, we send people over and they are part of the committees that go through different areas of asthma and come up with different guidelines. The NIH, however, uh, does not encourage the use of GINA guidelines here in the United States. Rather, they encourage the use of their guidelines here in the United States, which is the cover of the book on the right-hand side of the screen. The NIH develops these guidelines. They started back in 1996, and they've had several iterations since then the latest being in 2007. So if you're developing a program or you're wondering what the best treatment between the two I'm looking at is, the data that's in there and any suggestion that the guidelines will give you is based on data prior to 2007. In 2017, that's a bit of a problem because a lot has been done since then. So they definitely need to be updated. However, in 2015, NIH came out and said, we know GINA's updating their guidelines in 2016. We know their complete overhaul and have been redone with the latest data, but don't use them because we're updating ours. And there is a reason for this, and that is the method each one of them uses to evaluate the, the evidence that's out there is different. And by using different methods of analysis, you might arrive at different conclusions, and therefore your guidelines will result in different suggestions. So, in case you didn't know, there are three methods to do comparative effectiveness research <laughs> analysis. The first one is the basic method, which has been around since DIRT. Um, everyone uses this to some extent. The other two, GRADE and the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality's EPC method, are more recent methods, with the EPC method having been developed around 2008-2009. And this is where the difference between GINA and the NIH guidelines come into play. Obviously, NIH is going to take the U.S. agency's EPC method, and GINA is going to take the GRADE method. So both the GRADE and the EPC method start with the basic method, so we'll go over that first. The basic method says, okay, there's four types of studies out there in the world. There's randomized controlled trials from a large study, randomized controlled trials from a small study, non-randomized trials and observational studies are lumped together, and then there's opinions. Um, op-eds, uh, you know, different no normative type of writings. And so we have these A, B, C, D categories, which are highly sophisticated, as you can see. And basically, the evidence in category A is to be weighted as the best evidence that we have to answer our questions. The evidence in category D is to be weighted as far as being the least worthy of being considered to make a decision when we consider policy or treatment questions. Grade, and, there are problems with this method though, and they became highlighted when we found that 
our recommendations based on randomized controlled trials were not, um, the results in the real world were not mimicking the results from randomized controlled trials. We really see this in asthma when we expected the use of in the inhaler on a daily basis to really control asthma, reduce health care effects, and it wasn't happening. And the reason why, why wasn't it happening? Well, it wasn't happening because people were not using the inhaler. So we had this great medicine that no one's using. In fact, uh, compliance rates used to be down by 20%. Down to like 20% of the population would actually use their inhaler. And part of what we classify as not using it is using it, but actually using it in a way where the medicine doesn't get to your lungs. So, in effect, you're not taking the medication. So, we decided we're going to employ education um, programs throughout the United States and we're going to teach people how to use it. We're also going to develop those spacers so that it'll help people learn how to use the inhaler correctly and get the medicine into their lungs. And through these things, we'll see compliance rates rise. We will see um, asthma being more controlled. Hospitalizations and ED visits will go down. Healthcare costs will go down. This is great. And it worked a little bit but not anywhere near what people thought it would be. So now we're to the point where we see about 30 to 50 percent compliance rates with the inhaler. Still nowhere, it's not even at the level where we need it to be. But the interesting part is if you ask them, well, how, how many days are you using your inhaler? They'll tell you, oh, I'm using it most of the days, probably like 80 percent of the time. But if you actually go in and do the research, it's more like 50%. So we can't really take what they say at face value. And hence, we're still seeing the problems. Contrast this with the Leuco trying, where it's a pill you take once a day, and you see compliance rates up to 80 to 90% on a regular basis. If someone has um, allergies, then you will actually see compliance rates go up to almost 100% because leukotrienes, otherwise known to many as Singular, is also used to treat seasonal allergies. So if you happen to have both allergies and asthma, chances are you're taking your medication every single day. So in the long run, what we found by analyzing the evidence with just a basic method is the fact that we have a highly effective clinically effective drug in the inhaler that no one's taking. And if we continue suggesting that as to be the preferred treatment, that's great as long as we realize that no one's going to use it. Or we can suggest using the leukotrienes, which is less clinically effective, so it won't actually control the biology that's going on as well. However, people are going to use it on a regular basis. And that's kind of the crux of where my research is, and that's the crux of the current debate that's going on within the community. So like I said, people said, okay, this is not working because we're, we're saying all of our evidence should really support what the randomized controlled trial is saying, but when we put it out into the real world, people refuse to use it. So what do we do? Well, we came up with GRADE and the EPC method. And they're very similar. They build off the basic method with the A, B, C, D rankings of the literature, but then they take it a step further in the analysis. And they have seven domains that you look at the evidence over. And when you're looking at the evidence in the GRADE or the EPC method, you're not looking at each study individually, but you're looking at groups of study. So you're examining the evidence on a whole. The seven domains include the risk of internal bias, the consistency of the findings across the evidence, the directedness of the comparison, Am I direct, is the study directly comparing the treatment to the outcome, or is there kind of some sort of indirect analysis going on? 
what is the precision of the, of the finding. Uh, if there's a dose response that is done within the study, is the dose response going in the way that we would expect it to go? Or once we enter in a dose response, is it giving us conflicting information? What are the confounding issues of the studies? And is there publication bias? The difference between EPC and GRADE is how they use the domains. In the GRADE analysis, in the GRADE method, what we're doing is we're using the first three domains to lower the weight that we apply to the evidence of randomized controlled trials. And then we're using the last four domains to increase the weight of what we would consider evidence from non-randomized or observational studies. And they did this to try to find a little bit of balance between the two types of studies. One that is really from the, gener the general public and one who's controlling their population more. The ending result is, is well, let me back up a little bit. Um, for raising the weight of how you weight the observational study evidence, GRADE recommends you actually not do that. That if you have a difference and you would raise it up, you should raise it up only when you have overwhelming evidence across more than one of the four domains that we really should elevate the weight of this data. As a result, people tend not to elevate how much, how much weight they give to observational and non-randomized control studies, and we're still primarily looking at randomized control studies. This is different from the EPC method. The EPC method said, no, we're still not getting enough of a balance, so what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to start with the ABCD ranking, and we're going to allow you to increase or decrease the weight you gave, give to each type of evidence on any of the seven domains. So when you consider this, a real poorly designed randomized control trial could end up, you could look at it and, well, this is crap. Or a really great observational study, you could look at it and say, well, this is actually worth something. And so you might want to take the evidence su <coughs> supplied by the observational study over that found in a randomized control trial. And there lies the difference between the two. And I think that's part of the reason why NIH is like, no, don't go with Gina. You wait till you know, we can update our own because we have a different method that we want to apply to looking at the evidence. And this is where my research starts, right here. Hence my research. Um, so I did my literature review, and I found 16 studies that met my criteria. There was a leukotriene versus in, uh, inhaled corticosteroid comparison with an outcome of inpatient hospitalization or ED visits um, based on or for asthma. And I then divided the studies into their outcomes, because of course you can't have all 16 articles have the same exact outcome. So I stratified by the outcomes. The composite means that they had to have a hospitalization and something else. So a hospitalization and an oral corticosteroid, or a hospitalization and a doctor visit, a hospitalization and an ED visit. It, so there was some sort of combination. The other ones um, you see the slashes, so it would be an inpatient hospitalization or an ED visit. Um, OCS is an oral corticosteroid, which is different from the inhaler. It's used for more severe asthma. Or they just looked at one or the other. So I didn't want to combine studies because they weren't all measuring the same exact thing. Um, there are only two randomized controlled trials, and they both had the composite outcome. Everything else was pretty much an observational study. And uh, some of them use a ca causal inference 
technique in their statistical analysis and others did not. I separated that out because I felt that some of them were trying to deal with internal bias, whereas others were not. And since the statistical analyses were different, I decided I had to look at them in a different light. Uh, many of the studies actually had more than one outcome that they reported. So if you add up all these numbers, they're not going to go to 16. So then I went through all the studies, all the strata, and I graded them according to both the grade and the EPC method. When I got to the grade method, I had a problem because I had observational studies with causal inference and observational studies without. But I wasn't allowed to really raise my, how I weighted that evidence just based on that fact. So I decided, okay, well, we'll start with all my observational studies on the, at a very low level. <laughs> And then I'll raise the causal inference studies to a low level and see if I can push them even higher. Um, and of course, in my paper, I have a bit more of an argument than that, but we'll go with that for now. Um, the interesting part is that based on the grade scaling, the grade method, the randomized control trials were dropped all the way down to a low weight. So I ended up with a lot of evidence but not having a lot of confidence that I was the, what I, the outcomes I were seeing were actually worth building off of. Take that to the EPC level where I'm able to go up and down on any of the seven domains and all of a sudden you start to see a different picture emerge. And um, that is when it becomes interesting in my perspective. So I have things that I was able to say, you know what, I, I can raise this up a little bit and I'm going to because it's, it doesn't meet the criteria under grade, but it's worth considering. And so I raised it to a moderate. In the grade criteria, I lowered the randomized controls all the way down to low because it was just based on three domains. But in EPC, I can raise them back up based on the other four domains. And so I ended up with my randomized control trials, having a, me having a moderate level of confidence uh, of the weight of that evidence. There are two that, stratum that are listed as insufficient, and that's because there wasn't enough data to, do, to evaluate on all seven domains. Um, whether the uh, results were conflicting, or um, there just wasn't enough information in the article itself to be able to evaluate it. So I listed it as insufficient because it was insufficient, I guess. Um, then I decided, okay, well now I weighted all this and from the weight I can say, would I support saying we should give LTRA versus over an inhaled corticosteroid as our first um, as our, the first treatment we give to an asthma patient. And for the most part, I said yes, although my yes goes from a very weak yes to a, a more resounding yes. Nothing would I shout from the rooftop based on this evidence. Um, and there are the two with insufficient data, why well, can't draw a conclusion there? Um, because I didn't have enough data to do that with. The yes with a caveat I'll touch on in a bit. Then I decided, okay, well, let's just see, based on, based on the results of the study, do the results of the study find the inhaler did better or the leukotriene did better, did the same or better? And again, they have multiple outcomes, so it's a little different to tell, difficult to tell. But what you can tell is that only four studies found that the inhaler did better at reducing ED visits and hospitalizations for asthma patients. And this is where I'd say there's something worth to this evidence that maybe we need to try a different route than what we're currently doing. Um, the TAN article where it says for adherent groups only, she only found the, in, the inhaler did better for groups that had a compliance rate, adherence rate to the medication of 80% or above. So 
if you are compliant, actually compliant 80% of the time with your inhaler, then the inhaler did a better job at controlling your asthma. For the general population in that study, the leukotrienes actually did better. So now I'm looking to take this to the Maryland pop Medicaid population and see what we find here in Maryland. Um, I don't really believe 16 studies is sufficient to go ahead and make any drastic changes in any policy for our asthma programs here in Maryland. So let's first find out what's going on in Maryland. Maryland does have an asthma control program. If you go to the Department of Health's website, you can find it quite easily. Um, it was established in 2002 in order to help deal with the growing asthma problem here in Maryland. And part of what they're looking to do is they're looking to disseminate the guidelines and make sure that practitioners and the community leaders and people that run different interventions are following the guidelines closely so that we can try to bring the evidence-based medicine into real life within Maryland and reduce the burden of asthma. Um, they have a couple objectives that I outlined here. Um, one is to look at disparate populations, so a Medicaid population would actually really fit with that. Uh, the other one is to continue to assess the knowledge of our medications we're using. And again, my research falls in line with that. So I figured Maryland Medicaid data seemed like a pretty good fit for my research. The other reason why I picked Maryland Medicaid, other than the fact that I work with it every day, is the fact that in the Lee and the Wu articles, um, those two were the only articles that looked at, at a Medicaid population. The rest of the articles all looked at a commercial population. And what um, the Lee and the Wu articles both come from the same large asthma study that's in Tennessee. It's called the Peel Network. They both use that population. Wu looked, Wu looked only at children, whereas Lee looked at everybody. So they're the only ones that differentiated between commercial and Medicaid. And this is really important because Medicaid actually carries most of the burden for asthma patients. They live in poor conditions where you have higher pollutants. They um, have different stresses than the rest of us, and which can aggravate asthma. Smoking is a huge cause of asthma and irritant for asthmatics, and Medicaid pop poorer populations have a higher rate of smoking in general. Um, so there are a lot of different, Medicaid has a sizable African American population. So all in all, you see that Medicaid populations are where a lot of our asthmatics reside. So to, to me, that there's only really one study out there looking at a Medicaid population and what the treatment should be is, is quite surprising to me. The other thing that became real evident looking at these articles is the practice pattern between a commercial population and the Medicaid population was vastly different. In a commercial population, only 20% are going to be um, treated with the leukotrienes. 80% are going to be given the inhaler. They found in Tennessee Medicaid that it's a 50-50 split. So one would hope that the 50-50 split different from the 80-20 would result in at least the same outcomes for the population. Um, if not, one can dream that it would be better. So I thought, well, let's add to the Medicaid database and let's go and take this information and see what we find in the Maryland data. The TAN article also caught my interest because they did break out that highly compliant um, group with the inhalers. And once you break out the highly compliant, what you're seeing is results similar to the randomized control trial. Why this interests me, because if this remains true and, and there's no reason to think that it wouldn't, then what we, want to do, what we might want to do is assess 
who's compliant with the hailer and who's not. Because if we can assess who's, in, who's compliant with taking the inhaler, of course we want to give them the inhaler. It's the better drug. But if we can assess that perhaps this group of people won't use the inhaler, then why don't we try something else that will work with their behavior better and get them to take a medication to kind of try to bring asthma control up to a certain level. And so those are the two things that I'm going to look at, just the Medicaid population in a whole and um, how compliance rates interacts with this idea of um, which medication is the better medication. Um, I got my data two weeks ago, so it's not quite ready to give you any results yet. <laughs> but I will provide results once I get them. Um, I'm actually really excited. I'm getting a larger population than I thought I would in the beginning. So I'm kind of hoping that it will end up that way in the long run, and I'll take it from there. So any questions? You can clap. I don't care. <laughs> I'll ask a question. That's that yes, great. Mike. That was great, Jen. Um, uh, so, uh, just one specific question about a comment you made, which, which uh, I'm curious about. You said in Tennessee, Medicaid it was 50/50 between Singular and the inhaler, and in private, right? It's 80/20, right? So, tell us why. Why that might be? What do you, do you know why that? Well, there, there's a couple reasons why. Um, if you specifically, they didn't really give a reason why. They just noted that there was a difference. Um, if you look at anecdotal evidence, um, and I will give you an anecdotal story in response. I was at my primary care physician's office a couple months ago, and she asked me what my dissertation was on, and I told her. And she just stopped everything. And she turned completely towards me and she said, oh my god, this is wonderful. And I'm like, oh my god, it is, OK. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, no, you don't understand. I'm the medical director here, and we have this argument all the time. She said, some of us want to give the leukotriene first. And depending on what insurance the, the person has, we can or we can't. Some insurance require you to wait six months. She's like, other doctors here say, no, the guidelines say the inhaler, we have to stick with the inhaler. The argument comes down to, especially for single parents, is trying to get a child to use the inhaler is extremely difficult. Medicaid programs have a lot of children in them. So if you're a working mother, working father, trying to get out the door in the morning, your child, of course, is going to throw a tantrum because you're trying to get out the door in the morning. Trying to get them to use the inhaler is difficult. So rather give you the pill. The other thing that is interesting that started to be revealed within observational studies is the fact that smoking makes the inhaler less effective to a significant degree. So if you have a population that smokes, you don't want to give them the inhaler. The leukotriene will do better in every scenario. So, well, not every scenario. I shouldn't say that. Never know. Never say never, right? But um, so with those two things in mind, I would say that that's probably why Medicaid, people serving the Medicaid population might be doing something different. Um, commercial population, you're going to have a richer population. They're, they, are, they have their stresses, but their stresses are going to be different, and they might not be ones that really impact whether or not um, parents are saying, just give me something else, I refuse to use the inhaler. Yes? So, um, yeah, first of all, thanks for the acknowledgement of the Maryland Asthma Control Program. Oh, you're but welcome. <laughs> much appreciated by the program. A um, couple of questions. Um, first, um, have you talked at the Medicaid MCOs, the managed care organizations, about the extent to which pharmacy benefits 
programs do or do not allow leukotrienes as opposed to the, in terms of your data, uh, in terms of whether or not they'll cover those as opposed to inhaled corticosteroids. Because that could because most of them actually uh, will, in following the NEPP guidelines, will start with an inhaled corticosteroid because the evidence for it is stronger. Frankly. Correct, correct. Um, actually, in Maryland Medicaid, doctors can prescribe whichever. Yes, that's so, true. So well, they, have you talked with the, the MCOs about? When I, when I look at the data, uh, the data, when I look at the data, and please take this with a grain of salt because it's, it's you know, I haven't really gotten into it yet, but I'm seeing an 80-20 split. So I'm, I'm seeing a split in Maryland that would resemble something in a commercial population. Right. Um, so as far as speaking to MCOs directly, uh, I have not, um, although that's not difficult for necessarily for me to do. <laughs> um, right. And then the second question would be, since you're early in data analysis, you don't have any idea what the loss to follow-up is for kids who drop out. Uh, there's a significant churning of the population as they move from MCO to MCO which interrupts therapy and how you're going to deal with that? Um, the, there is a churn population, but from my perspective, I'm really not concerned about them moving from MCO to MCO as much of them moving out of Medicaid. And overwhelmingly, um, as far as children are concerned, you're typically in Medicaid for a right. year. So um, I'm not really concerned about moving from MCO. You when you move from MCO to MCO, you see a, a bit of discontinuity, but it's, it's not anything like you might see in, in a different insurance area. And then the final question is, what are your outcome measures? Inpatient hospitalization and ED visits for asthma. And how I'm, just, just so you know, how I'm setting up my study is more or less in some of the decisions are in line with decisions that are common through the studies that I, I reported today. So um, as, as far as some of my definitions. So it, it's going to pull a wider population than one might argue for, but it, it's consistent with the rest of the literature. I'll talk with you afterwards if you'd like. <laughs> yes. Okay. I'm, I'm sort of back to the methods part. Um, you had that grade in, what was the other one, EPC? I can't remember yep. the acronym. Yeah, grade in EPC. Um, that, those seem to be about a very general thing about how you weight studies. Right. Do you have a sense, have people applied that weighting scheme to other medical things? other social science things, other sorts of things, and say, when people use grade, you know, to weight the studies, we find that they get better outcomes, better results, whatever, than if they apply EPC. Is there, is there any, anything about to suggest that one of those, and I'm not sure what I mean by the word better here, but one of those does better than the other in terms of giving better weight to better things as it turns out in practice or you something? You mean grade versus EPC? Yeah. Um, not really. I mean, that's part of the reason why I did what I did is taking one group of literature and doing it the two different ways right. because I really didn't see that within the literature. Um, using the grade and the EPC method are subjective mm -hmm. because you, I did high, medium, low you can use a scale of one to ten. You know, it, you can do happy face, sad face. <laughs> you know, so everyone's going to do it differently. So trying to make any type of comparison is becomes difficult. As far as making a direct comparison, like I attempted to do, um, I had not seen that done before. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist. I just hadn't come across it. Also, the EPC method coming out in 2008 is primarily, primarily only used in the U.S. Mm -hmm. and 
in the Canada right along the border. So um, there hasn't been much done, I think, as far as contrasting the two, um, because NIH kind of came out and said, this is the method we're pushing, mm -hmm. and forget that over there. <laughs> so um, does that answer your question? Well, it, 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 I mean, it, it perpetuates it in a sense. Which right, makes it kind of right. I mean, you know, I mean, it's just that, you know, I, I personally tend not to do empirical stuff very much, probably because you get, you know, these you know, econometric, you know, shouting contests or something right. like that that they often sort of don't. But I mean, everybody and everything they work in, whereas, well, this study says this, this study says that. And so there's this thing when someone actually has to do something, whether it's the asthma control people or, 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 or but to say anybody in anything, whether whether they implement a minimum wage law, whether, you know, you, you name it. Um, it's like, well, you've got all these studies. How do we weight them? Right. And you've got, you've obviously looked in enormous detail into a couple of different ways in which these things get weighted. And it's a, and it's a, it's a general problem, it strikes me, is, is how one decides, well, what are you going to do with all this stuff? And, and here, and, and somebody has given that, you and these people to come up with things, have given that some thought somehow, and I, mean, I realize it's going to be subjective at the end of the day, I'm not asking some sort of number sort of thing, but it may be that, that, um, that you know, the, to the extent that one would ever judge any kind of em empirical body of work in sort of a meta-analysis way or something, I suppose, would be to say, well, if people weight these kinds of studies, these will be given more weight than these, but if you do it another way, it's going to come out the reverse. And it turns out that when these studies get weighted more, you tend to get more accurate, better findings, better design policy, more cost effective than the others, or you do in different contexts, that sort of thing. I mean, that's, I mean, that's, again, I'm, you know, this isn't, this isn't helping people breathe better, I suppose, but it's, but it's just the kind of question that pops to mind because I was really interested in what you were pointing out there. Well, I think the reason why the EPC method started to evolve well, mm -hmm. the reason why grade evolved to begin with is mm -hmm. because what we assumed was going to happen in real life wasn't happening. Right. And so we developed grade. And well, that kind of got, got, kind of got us a little bit further, but it still seems to be um, not quite enough, insufficient. And so the EPC method has come. I think all of this is just us trying to understand how to take the, the evidence and translate it into a way that we can actually put something into action right. rather than all these providers doing stuff, you know, the way they want to and, you know. No, it's really great that you're confronting it so explicitly. That's, it's really interesting. Thanks very much. Yep. Yes. The question kind of follows on Tim. So, you know, it sounded like we said, well, we have these RCTs that show great results of, of the inhaler, but then when we get into the real world, right, there's some implementation issues, right? Right. Um, so we have to think about how we weight observational studies. What about RCTs that, that are implemented in the real world? Um, in other words, I guess maybe I don't know exactly what you mean by a clinical RCT, but I'm imagining in the hospital where a doctor is, you know, making sure we have 100% compliance when taking the, the steroid. But it seems like, you know, is there room for studies where we go out and we, we still do a randomized control trial so we get that strength, but we're doing it in the real world, so what picking up, you know, may be, may be a lack of implementation, but we see that in the RCT. Do, do those types of studies happen in this field? Is that a conversation? They, they do. The problem with them is that they're highly expensive, mm -hmm. and typically research can't support that. Pharmaceutical companies can support that because they're looking to make bank at the end with their new drug. Um, but research can't always support that. There are things that are called pragmatic studies, pragmatic controlled studies, and that they're kind of what you're describing. Um, I don't think any have been done in the U.S. They've been done in Europe. Um, and actually, the one I'm thinking about was done in Europe, and that's actually where you started to see the issue with smokers because they realized, well, smoking is actually <laughs> really an issue. And then the biologist or biochemist got a hold of it and actually found that there's really a reason for that. Um, 
So there are studies that happen like that. They're, they just happen to be more expensive, and that ends up to be the challenge for researchers to get over. Yes. Yeah, I was wondering more about what might be going on in the manufacturing side of things. So you, you mentioned about the pharmaceutical <coughs> companies. So, and I, maybe you briefly hit that. I mean, are there issues with some of the research on effectiveness being sponsored by the manufacturers? And are, do they, is that part of the issue being about why there's conflicting evidence on effectiveness? And then the other dimension of manufacturing, I'm just wondering about, can you talk about sort of differences in cost, or all the, are there these patents involved and so on that's going to affect the pricing? Uh, and the, but then another dimension is, insofar as there is sort of patent issues involved in research, is there a possibility that down the road that this, these pills that are apparently people are more likely to take in certain contexts, could those be enhanced further in their effectiveness with, with research? Okay, so let me, let me go to the first question. Um, one of the major problems some people have with using the GINA guidelines is the fact that GINA is backed by the pharmaceutical companies. So <laughs> people are concerned that having a backing from the pharmaceutical company, a tie to a pharmaceutical company, there's going to be maybe some pressure to go a certain way than another. Um, so, that, you know, so, so that is an issue there. Um, as far as randomized control studies, um, the leukotriene is the newer of the two drugs. Inhaled corticosteroids have been around pretty much forever, and it doesn't really matter who or um, when a study is done between the two. If you look at randomized controlled trials across the board, the inhaler does significantly better. So I wouldn't be worried of any necessary pharmaceutical bias there. Um, what brought this attempt, this, these, that, what brought these specific drugs to my attention was the fact that I was doing research um, in where to take my research. And uh, Singular came off patent in August 2012. So things that were cost prohibitive before all of a sudden became far less cost prohibited. And now there's like four different generic types you can buy. Um, I believe the inhaler is still cheaper, although don't quote me on that, but I would say not like it used to be. In the early 2000s, Singular was far more expensive and one could make a cost argument as to why the inhaler ought to be used. I would say that's less of an argument now. But I'll be looking at cost as well, so I can let you know. <laughs> that answer your yeah, questions? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Um, then I have um, okay, I have a box here. <laughs> but, uh, thank you again, and we have um, thank you a little. Um, uh, plaque and recognition of the award. So, and I want to thank, thank everyone again uh, for um, joining us. And uh, please help yourself to the refreshments and meet Jennifer. Thank so. you.